Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Our panel uh, now is Cities of the Future, the Promise of AI-Enabled Public Services. As Camille mentioned, I am Brandi Nonick. I'm a postdoc here at Citrus and the Bonato Institute. So currently, over half of the world's population lives in cities. By 2050, it will be nearly 70%. Can you imagine, 70% of the world's population will live in cities. This influx is going to put huge demand on our public service agencies. The current status quo will not suffice. Adoption of innovative approaches and systems will not be optional. It will be critically necessary. AI holds great potential to profoundly impact how our cities function. Increasing speed and accuracy of decision making and services while enhancing quality and hopefully the city's livability. However, as we've found out from our presentations earlier today, data and algorithms applied in AI may have embedded biases that perpetuate social, economic, racial, and gender inequalities. The benefits and risks of AI may not be equally distributed across all social strata. They'll make false predictions and errors, some of which are legal and social systems are not yet equipped to deal with. It will be critically important to continuously conduct analyses of the impacts of AI and to apply these analyses at all stages, from conception to design to deployment to reevaluation and back to conception. Today, you're going to hear from three leading experts who are studying the role and impact of AI on society. Today, they'll discuss these roles and impacts within the realm of public services. So today, we're joined by three panelists, Mariko Davidson, Megan Garcia, and Roberto Manducci. And I will introduce each of them. There will be the same structure as panel one. They'll give brief remarks, and then we'll convene together on stage for a moderated session, and then we'll open up the floor for Q&A. So please keep your eyes peeled for individuals walking around with note cards, and feel free to write your questions down, and we'll bring them up to the stage. Um, so I'll start with uh, Mariko Davidson. As San Francisco's Civic Partnerships Manager, Mariko builds cross-sector city initiatives to leverage technology for the public good. She brings a deep expertise in cities, specializing in governance, data policy, and transportation. Prior to Microsoft, Mariko started the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Open Data Initiative, which I can imagine was no small feat. Uh, she has also served in the Boston Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics, and previously she worked with cities across the Asia Pacific with the East-West Center, and in India with the ITDP. She holds a Master in City Planning from MIT. Let's welcome Marika. Thanks, Brandy. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm Mariko Davidson, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. I build civic partnerships for the city of San Francisco and for Microsoft. And for the past 10 years, I've been working with and for cities um, on civic innovation and partnership building. So I'm an urban planner by training, and that really means that um, I have a deep expertise in cities. I understand how, and we all understand how cities are designed, operates, and are governed. Um, so moving on, and what do we do here at Microsoft? I'm part of a group called the Technology and Civic Engagement Group. And we were formed about three years ago with the very statistics in mind that Brandy talked about. You know, by 2050, over 70% of the world, or almost 70% of the world's population will now live in urban areas. And that makes cities incredibly important. It's where so much of the action is taking place, and so much of the transformation we're seeing taking, taking place. So I'm part of a team that we're, we're present in six different cities across the US, Boston, Boston, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, San Jose, and Seattle. 
And together, we build partnerships with public sector, private sector, academia, and nonprofit that leverage technology for, technology for the public good. And this is a bit of logo soup for you to give you a sense of what kind of organizations we work with and what kind of partnerships we build. And I'm going to be pretty brief in my remarks because I want to really focus on the, the opportunities around questions and answers as it relates, relates to AI. But every city has their own flavor, and ours in San Francisco, we focus on accessibility, resiliency, and economic development. And what I want to share with you are one of the, is one of the projects that's come out of um, our accessibility team at Microsoft. It's another way of implementing and looking at the promise of AI in cities. So a lot of what we're going to talk about on this panel and what we have talked about is AI within governance. And this is uh, AI within um, uh, product. So seeing AI is a new type of technology that basically started as uh, with a hackathon at Hack for Good. And it was a group of teammates that came together and really discovered some of the challenges of citywide navigation. So using AI technology, they developed something called Scene AI. It's under development now still, but it's a way that helps uh, the blind or visually impaired navigate through the city. Um, using a pair of glasses that sees for you and then gives you audio direction in your ear. So I'm going to leave it at that and we will continue the conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next I'll introduce Megan Garcia. Megan Garcia is Senior Fellow and Director of New America, California, exploring how the work of New America's programs linked to exciting local approaches to problem solving taking place on the West Coast. She is an expert on national security policy and writes about how it can be better informed by the processes deployed here in Silicon Valley. Previously, Garcia was a program officer at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, where she oversaw the creation of the foundation's cyber initiative, designed to help generate a field of cybersecurity and internet policy experts more focused on the public good. So let's welcome Megan. So I'm gonna talk just really succinctly about a couple of things I, I think cities can do to try and ensure that as they're increasingly using AI and machine learning, as we know cities are in fact doing across the country, how they can do it with hopefully less bias. So thing number one, this may seem obvious, but unfortunately it's not. If you are a city and you are thinking about either building a technology or working with a partner to build a technology or acquire a technology, use a diverse team. Again, it sounds like diversity 101, but so often this isn't the case. And so we know that there, so I should explain, there are two ways that I think about algorithms themselves being biased and sort of there being a machine learning bias. The first is the underlying data can be biased. So if you take as a neutral example, like let's imagine probably someone in this room is this, someone's a social media expert and they are looking at all of social media across the world and if they don't know that the number one country users of social media if you think about twitter are um, american their outcomes are going to be biased right like that's just a neutral example so number one data can be biased number two the code itself and the technology itself can be biased and and you know most often that's not intentional but it, it does happen so again one of the things we can do have teams be diverse Relatedly, I should say, if you're a city and you're acquiring a technology, ensure that the team at that technology company is also diverse. Number two, model internal auditing. So internal auditing is something that's been proposed to try and help technology companies deal with algorithmic bias. So as I mentioned, a lot of times there's inherent bias in institutions. We don't know it's there, no one's trying to be biased, but it still emerges all the time. So one of the things cities can do is exert pressure on technology companies that they may have as partners or they may be acquiring products from to ensure that they are getting audited, to have an external party come and look and try and help them figure out places either with 
their teams or with their technology where there might be bias. So I'll stop there and we'll continue the conversation. Okay, our last panelist, Roberto Manducci. Uh, Roberto is a professor of computer engineering at UC Santa Cruz, where he leads research in computer vision and sensor processing with applications to assistive technology. Before joining UC Santa Cruz in 2001, he worked at Apple and at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Thank you, Brandy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Camille, also for organizing this beautiful symposium. Can you guys hear me? Yes. I don't need to scream, good. Um, all right, so my name is Roberto Manducci. I teach not far from here in Santa Cruz. Um, I work on assistive technology to help people with disabilities uh, in their daily life activities. And in particular, I work with people who are blind or have low vision, but mostly blind people. Um, and you can imagine if you are blind, if you cannot see, there are a lot of things that are kind of difficult to do to understand where you are, how to go to a certain place, uh, who is in front of you, uh, what is this object, how to grab it, um, how to read a sign, and things like that. So we work on multiple types of technology to try to pinpoint some of these problems and to solve them. And you see here uh, some of the, I don't like to call them subjects, participants, friends who come and very patiently test what we develop in my lab. We use a number of technologies. Um, for example, computer vision. We heard Fei Fei this morning give a beautiful talk about you know, the promise of computer vision. Um, and in fact, I myself come from a computer vision background. And in part, I started working um, with blind people because I thought, hey, that's, that's, uh, obviously uh, the, the, the best thing to do for somebody who cannot see is to complement it with the camera. After all, we are making cars see, we make robots see, we're gonna make people see with cameras. Well, it's not that easy, in part because people are no robot and are no cars. Um, in part because Such a um, right now, people who carry around a camera on their body are um, cyclists with a GoPro, policemen with a body camera, um, and then a few people who tried Google Glasses, but that didn't end up well. So um, maybe at some point, everybody's going to carry a camera. As of now, you don't want to be the blind person who's still going to doubt because you're carrying something weird. But thankfully, there are cameras in our smartphones, so we can use that. And, um, but still, there are problems, in part because um, if you've ever seen a video taken as you walk around with your uh, smartphone and with the camera on, that looks very different from the image databases that are used to train your computer vision algorithms. They're blurry, they're messy. Um, but in, especially, and that's something I really like, is because, well, I like to work on, because it is very difficult to use a camera if you cannot see. And if you're ever trying to take a picture with your phone or with your camera without looking into the screen or in the viewfinder, you know what I'm talking about. That's what I call computer vision without sight. So we spent a lot of time with blind people going around with a cell phone camera to try to find objects with a computer vision algorithm running on that and walk towards the objects and do things like that. And it's, we discovered a lot of interesting things. It's not as easy. Um, um, but um, there's an example you can see, for example, in the bottom right there of using cameras for reading documents. And there are very nice and very well-functioning applications of optical character recognition, OCR, that you can buy or even get for free for your phone. Um, they can read a document for you if you take a good picture. Problem is, if you're blind, it's difficult to take a good picture of the document. And so it's kind of like, you know, a, 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 a loop here. And um, so we developed some technology that actually helps you by running specific computer vision algorithms. Uh, move the camera so that eventually you can take a well-framed picture of the document that you want to read. But we are working also with different technology, for example, inertial sensing. Um, the good thing of smartphones is that they have a whole load of sensors that right now, then, you know, they are relatively accurate after all. Um, and you can use them with your cell phone safely tucked inside your pocket so you don't have to look goofy or, or, or strange walking around with one phone when the other hand is also already uh, busy holding your cane or keeping a dog. Um, and for example, in the top right, um, this is some experiments we just completed last week. 
about um, a project we called Ariadne's Thread. It's a system that helps you retrace a path that you took inside a building with the phone tracking you silently as you walked on the way in, maybe together with a sighted person took you to the room or took you to the bathroom and you want to get back and you're completely lost because if you're blind, anything that's beyond your arm's reach is like 10 miles away, okay? You can get lost. I had people getting lost in a bathroom. It's, it's very, it's kind of mind-boggling thinking about how it is to try to have spatial awareness without sight. Anyways, I wanted to mention a couple of projects that we have ongoing in my lab that I think are quite um, germane to the topic of discussion today. One to the left is a project about accessible transit. We call it Route Me Too. Um, I personally like public transit a lot, but you know, for some people, public transit is the only choice because they can't drive a car. And that's an example for people who are blind, but also for people who might be very old as some type of cognitive uh, problems that touch the dementia and, and they simply can't drive the car. They could take a public transit. But taking public transit may be difficult for many people because of the difficult, difficulty of accessing information. Imagine if I'm blind, how do I know that I am at the right bus stop, that I'm facing the street, that I'm located in the right place where if the driver of the bus sees me, will stop. Um, so this system is a cloud system that takes location information, takes information from the transit agencies, and make sure that you or make sure that helps you successfully complete your trip. Make sure that you are in the right bus stop, you uh, take the right bus, you exit at the right time, and etc. And the other project I'm going to mention very briefly has to do with accessible maps. Now uh, we all have become map users thanks to Google Map. Uh, Google Maps we use them mostly outdoors, also because there are very few buildings that have been mapped by Google as yet indoors. Uh, but there is a lot of effort and interest in heavy indoor mapping. The problem is that if you're blind, you need a much finer level of detail in your map. If you're sighted, so long as you know, okay, I'm in a certain room, and I know that if I take this corridor, I'm going to that room, okay, that's the door. But if you are blind, um, everything again becomes more complicated. So you need to build some maps that have a much finer detail and we have, we are starting a project that uses um, 3D sensors that you can buy for 100 bucks now. We together attached to um, an iPad that allow you to take a 3D scan of a room, then build a full 3D map well annotated of your building and then communicate that to a blind person. That's where the fun begins. How do you communicate special information to people who are blind? Either through a spatial language, which is not an easy thing, or perhaps through embossed maps that are showing over there. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. We'll all join up. Okay. Go ahead and have a seat. Of course. Where do you want us? In whatever order you all would right. like. I might grab the end position here. Well, thank you all for your insightful remarks to kick off our panel discussion. Um, so I have a few questions that I'd like to propose to the panel as a whole, and then I have some follow-up questions for each of you specifically. And then I'd like to keep five to eight minutes or so at the end for audience Q&A. We already have some coming in, that's great. Um, so my first question, how do you think AI will transform the way governments design and deliver public services? But then I have a little bit of a caveat, a follow-up to that. So in what ways will the AI make public services better? But in what ways do you think AI will make public services worse? Do you want to start with that since you're the city's person? Sure. <laughs> um, I think that, so the, to start off, we all have a lot of faith in numbers. And we're really comfortable with numbers. Numbers, there's a, in math, there is a right and there is a wrong answer. And that's what makes math and statistics so compelling. But when you put that piece and put that thought process into real life, real life most of the time doesn't break into a right or a wrong answer. And you see this play out in um, you know, social justice areas and a, a lot of city services kind of uh, are woven into those fields. So I think there is a lot of complexity and nuance that isn't necessarily um, 
you're not able to make those decisions based on an algorithm. And so anytime you start thinking about an area where ethics is involved and value judgments that are more nuanced, mm -hmm. that isn't a definite right or wrong answer, where math can't necessarily provide that right or wrong answer, I think that's where you begin to get into trouble. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there is a lot of promise in terms of AI and city services, for example, around efficiencies and processes. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps there is you know, a great way to implement 311 services, so rather than calling, you have you know, your bot that navigates you through your city system and helps answer those types of questions. But I think that when we start talking about ethics and values and areas that need more nuanced decisions, mm -hmm. that becomes very problematic very quickly. Can you think of any areas off the top of your head where that applies, where you should have this more nuanced decision making and it shouldn't be fully automated? I mean, I think we heard from all the, you know, the justice, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, criminal defense, all of those areas, the judiciary system, that's where things can become very problematic quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think especially areas that um, have a history of discrimination. In Absolutely. The making would be yeah. a target area. Absolutely. Can I add on to yeah. that? I mean, yeah. I would say above and beyond city services, we know that there's been um, machine learning and AI bias in everything from, you know, loan decision making to sentencing, as we heard earlier, to, you know, banking processes, college admissions. So, in, as you're saying, almost any situation in which there is an ethical dimension and or kind of a human decision component, we know that AI has not done a great job. Mm -hmm. So I think caution is good. Um, the other thing I would say more broadly is that I think humanity in general right now just tends to think that technology is more inherently neutral than we are, mm -hmm. which is not in fact the case. Mm -hmm. um, and that technology, we're actually embedding technology with our own biases. And so, I mean, like, for example, I think the admissions process case is great. People were trying to make that process more efficient, mm -hmm. less biased. What ended up happening unintentionally was just that the biases were carried through to right. the machine learning. And so um, just not taking for granted that, you know, technology is going to be more neutral or a better arbiter. Exactly. Um, Roberta, did you want to add anything to this? I would add just from my point of view, all accessibility. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Accessibility is important. It's important that if we are providing services, these can be enjoyed by everybody. Um, and oftentimes that is not the case. And I, I just want to make a quick example. One of the, uh, I think, most successful technology tools for blind people has been the iPhone. It's been the iPhone because Apple has invested, after the first edition of the iPhone, time into making voiceover, which is part of the operating system that is a screen reader that makes it usable. Now, all of a sudden, blind people were able to access the same types of services as everybody else. I'm talking accessing news, Twitter, Facebook, and everything, on the same platform. That makes a huge difference. They didn't have to have a special tool designed for the blind. It was the same thing that you and I use. And that improved the quality of life of a lot of people. And all of a sudden, they had access to things. So accessibility is important. Uh, there is an issue, though, that accessibility usually comes at a cost. And so um, very often accessibility only is implemented if it is mandated. For example, by the American with Disability yeah. Act. And so what happens is that companies working in technology for accessibility need to fight for lobbying, lobby to try to impose that. So that, I think, is a very important issue for inclusiveness of all technology, including AI. So today in our panel and other panels, we've talked about bringing in our own bias, either through data or decisions made through the algorithm. Um, Megan, you recently wrote a piece for Wired that I really enjoyed, titled, and I like this title a lot. How to, I did not choose this title, but, but it's a good one. <laughs> how, to, how to keep your AI from turning into a racist monster. It's, we <laughs> should all be concerned. We can thank the Wired editors for that one. Yeah, I think it's great. <laughs> Spot on. But um, in that article, you cited a Carnegie Mellon study where they found that Google ads showed listings for high-income jobs um, more frequently to men than to women. Um, how can cities better ensure that their AI-enabled processes do not fall victim to these same types of biases? 
Well, I think it's, it's partly what we've been talking about, right? Like not just trusting that um, the AI or any piece of technology is going to be more neutral than humans and you know, start using as a starting point that it's going to take on whatever biases its creators and designers have. So doing everything that I talked about a few minutes ago, making sure that you know the city team is a diverse team, making sure the technology team is a diverse team, and therefore that they're going to be more on the lookout for the types of things that um, tend to lead to difficult situations. A non-city example of this, um, and a sort of relatively benign one, is um, you know there's the Google Photos uh, sort of PR disaster a few years ago where a young African American user was tagged as a gorilla, as was his friend. He put it on social media. Mm -hmm. um, that's the kind of thing where the data that was being fed, and photos are hard, but the data that was being fed, um, you know, to that algorithm clearly wasn't enough images of African Americans because otherwise it probably would have learned what an African American looked like, right? So mm -hmm. using that kind of thing as an example. Um, I think the other is there are some, some kind of innovative approaches out there that are just at the beginning of, of being talked about and, and tested. One I, I mentioned, um, which is encouraging technology companies to have external auditors um, to make sure that they are trying to figure out to the degree that it's possible where there might be bias in algorithms or underlying data. As we heard earlier, and I think at lunch, um, increasingly you know, with deep learning, that's less and less possible. Um, but I think that's even more of a mandate for everybody to sort of look at bias from the outset and from the design of, of products. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are some, some other really interesting theories out there. One is taken from video games, actually, um, which is the idea of using community policing for bias in technology. Um, so there are really interesting video games that have had huge you know, bullying problems and other problems in which they've um, created tribunals inside a video game to then ask users to seek out people who are violating ethics codes and, um, and then, you know, enforce when there are ethics violations. I think that that model is something that potentially could be applied to algorithmic bias and bias in AI. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's that's a really hard model for cities to implement, but it is a really interesting idea. Anything else to follow up? I would just, I just wanted to add a comment, um, building on Megan's point initially in her opening remarks about diverse teams and uh, Roberto's remarks about accessibility. I think just to take a step back, why is this beneficial for all of us? A, a great example is ADA. And ADA, when you're you know, in, instituted, institutionalized curb cuts and ramps. And what that did is that doesn't just benefit somebody with a wheelchair, in a wheelchair. That actually benefits some, you know, maybe somebody who's temporarily disabled on crutches, or uh, parents pushing strollers, or any service delivery pushing a cart. And so, actually, when you begin to, in, you know, create diverse teams that bring those different perspectives, and you institute policies that make your products more accessible, and when we begin to take that thinking and put it into you know, AI and how that affects our policy in cities, it's not just benefiting one special group. It's actually benefiting all of us as a whole and making it stronger. So I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And I think also from the private sector perspective, investing in technologies that support these communities, you may tap a market that you didn't know existed before. Right which benefits all. Uh, I couldn't agree more. That's a universal design concept, right? And right. people have learned that it is uh, much better from an economical point of view yep. to design things from the beginning mm -hmm. with an idea of accessibility rather than mm -hmm. retrofit things to make it accessible. Right. And the economical point of view, you're totally right. The, uh, now, I, I, I think in terms of people with disabilities, this is an untapped workforce. Um, I don't have the numbers at hand, but it could, you know, if these people were able to work, there would be a tremendous economical benefit, um, even just for the transit agency. So I work on a project that facilitates um, um, public transport usage by people with disabilities. Now, a lot of people use paratransit systems nowadays, which are mandated by the ADA. They are very expensive for the transit agencies. So all of a sudden, if they transit we're willing to invest more in infrastructure that allows this method. And they, they are listening, they, they, they definitely are open to that. That probably would be also an economic advantage to that. Right. 
I think tapping into these other communities for design inspiration is really important. And Mariko, you have a bit of experience with that. So during your time in Boston, you supported the maker and citizen science communities mm -hmm. um, in creating rapid prototypes to inform development of public infrastructure and services. So how do you think machine learning algorithms could be used to help these communities rapidly prototype um, these technologies? Yeah, one one of the ways, and I've been thinking about this. One of the ways that this could be possible is uh, visioning exercises, right? There's all sorts of um, planning and community engagement exercises to re envision your community, re envision what this intersection would look like if it were for people and not cars. And one of the ways that machine learning and AI can begin to play a role in that is through perhaps you know AR technology uh, mm -hmm. augmented reality hololens for you know Microsoft users mm -hmm. um, but it being able to take what's in front of you augment it with what's possible and then co-create what you would like to see actually mm -hmm. uh, in real life so that's that's one opportunity that's there and I will just say we actually have a fellow who is working on that so Ooh. we should Let's, chat yeah let's take a first <laughs> oh, wonderful. Okay. Okay. Um, and so to get back to Roberto, your work, I think you were touching lightly on your project, Route Me Too, um, which is designing a cloud-based system that will facilitate use of public transit by different communities of people with special needs. Um, my question was, how can this technology be applied to make cities more inclusive for people with disabilities? But I think, how can it make cities more inclusive for people who also don't have disabilities? For everybody, right? So let me just say two words more about this project. The idea of this project basically is to have um, be able to register a trip that you want to take, have a cloud system that monitors your trip through, through information that is sent from your own cell phone, and then take decisions. Um, so this could help, I would say, anybody, because if you ever taken a bus in a city that you don't know, or in a, a country that doesn't speak your language, there is a lot of anxiety. Uh, by using that, you might uh, the, the, the wrong exit and be in an unsafe area and etc. So I think, again, this is another example where some technology can help, people with certain community can help everybody. Um, but I think, in a, I also would like to add that this system has a flow of information, it goes um, position information from your cell phone to be sent to the cloud. That brings, of course, a lot of security issues. The last thing you want to have is a predator who knows that a person who is vulnerable is now tra traveling in a certain situation. But at some time, um, I see this as a piece of information in this urban fabric of information flow where everybody benefits, right? So for example, um, if, a, if I know as a blind person that there is a seat available in the bus in the front seat that I could know through crowdsourcing, and I'm not saying any, it's not science fiction, there's a project, uh, Tiramisu in Carnegie Mellon, where people crowdsource how many seats are available in the buses, for example. That would be extremely useful. At the same time, for a bus driver to know that there is a blind person standing at a bus stop could be useful, and et cetera. So uh, this just ties in into this all information that goes back and forth, you give some, you take some, with all the danger that comes with that, of course. And so I'd like to propose one question from the audience uh, before our panel session ends. Uh, most cities have numerous um, human or social needs focused nonprofits. What role can AI play in helping these nonprofits leverage their impacts? Hmm. I don't really know if it's fair for me to answer that because we're sort of in that sphere. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we come at it from the thinking side, right? So this, this sort of questioning and planning and strategy, um, I, think, I think it's really different on the implementation side and actually there's a lot of value in, in terms of what Mariko was talking about mm -hmm. in, in coordinating and simplifying processes. Mm -hmm. um, so for all different kinds of services where there's just a lot of information to be gathered, there's just okay. so much that AI might be able to do to make those processes faster and more streamlined for the user. Exactly, analyzing documents, going through data analysis, yeah. getting some key insights, and then right. using that to inform your work. Right. I mean, I'm just thinking about one example that came to mind is, you know, foster care and the mm -hmm. incredible amount of information. And this is, I'm, t I'm thinking just here about process, not about any decision making, because that 
could get ugly, but um, just thinking about, you know, there's so many people and so many inputs that go into getting somebody in foster care placed and to the right person and care for. And if all of that could, you know, very quickly be taken in um, and, and coordinated, that, you know, it, there's so many things like that where there's great examples. Right. Any application-based process yes. where there are many different departments involved and you as a citizen have no idea where to go or what to do, could you have, a, you know, a guide, an AI guide? And you're seeing, I think you're seeing in cities around the country, in part via partnerships like with Code for America and others, where, mm -hmm. you know, like the baseline of, of city services is often just the city's website and just making right. the entry points to city services easier, more navigable, you know, just more comfortable for the user. There's just so much to be done even at that basic level. Mm -hmm. Roberto, any closing remarks? Um, no, I, I'm, I'm an academician, so I can't speak much to the nonprofit. I would say, you know, um, uh, yeah, for why, for, from my point of view, AI is just one technology as others, however, with, because of course of the amount of data that comes, and especially because this data normally comes from people, uh, um, yes, it's, um, it's important or hard. I also want to add one quick thing about something that has, hasn't been, somehow hasn't come out yet. The relation between AI and crowdsourcing, mm -hmm. um, which is very important. Crowdsourcing, in a sense, is a tool for AI in order to extract information. Though crowdsourcing in itself is also a very important tool. For example, there exist applications for blind people that use crowdsourcing system by which a blind person can create a query, send it to the crowd, will answer back uh, with an answer from a sighted person, like tap tap see and be my eyes are some of these systems. Um, with um, and I think, honestly, the future is going to be, at least for this type of assistive applications, kind of a mixture of the two. Something that some people are starting to explore how to leverage the best direct human input with artificial input. Um, and I think that's, that's something that we're going to hear more and more when there is um, a level of human assistance that is needed. Yeah. I think that's really interesting thinking about crowdsourcing and AI. Some ideas that are popping mm -hmm. up. Um, well, let's thank our panel. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.